Hey everyone, welcome to the Kotlin 1.5 event. It's uh, nice to see all of you here. It's good Hi to all. be back on the broadcast. Hey, Sveta. Hi everyone. <laughs> Hi, Seb. Uh, I'm Svetlana Sakova, developer advocate uh, in JetBrains for Kotlin. Yeah, and my name is Sebastian Eigner. I'm also a developer advocate for Kotlin at JetBrains. Yeah, and today we have an uh, event uh, devoted to 1.5 uh, Kotlin release where we're going to discuss uh, some major highlights of the release, as well as uh, answer your questions. Right. So yeah, if you are currently tuned in, uh, make sure to let us know that you can see us well uh, and hopefully also hear us well. Probably not going to know for like 45 seconds or so because of the delay, but still, we'd appreciate it. So how are we going to fill this time until people can show up? <laughs> I think it should be fine because we already um, see this hello everyone comments. So hopefully it all works works well. So I think we can start. So Wonderful. again, what is the structure of uh, this event? At first, we're going to give um, the brief highlights of the release. Then after right after that, uh, Roman Elizarov will join and talk about the plans for 1.6. And the remaining time, all the remaining time, will be devoted to answering your questions. And uh, I want to apologize uh, right now to those of you whose questions uh, won't get answered because we we already have lots of questions, and we hope that we'll have more during YouTube chat, and uh, we hope to being able to answer those first uh, from YouTube chat. But we are going to post uh, to do to organize uh, the AMA session on Reddit on 27, 28th of May, where we first post all the unanswered questions with the corresponding answers. So please don't be offended if your question don't get answered. We hope to fix this situation afterwards, even if not in this during this event. Yeah, and uh, we are also mm -hmm. giving away a couple of nice uh, Kotlin t-shirts mm -hmm. for the best questions. Though, if you are tuning in and are already working at JetBrains, unfortunately, you do not qualify. Yep. And uh, for the, in case you ask, yes, this event will be recorded. The recording will be available. And uh, hello also to those who watch the recording uh, and not uh, us now live. Yeah. Cool. Um, I think that's most of the organizational mm -hmm. stuff out of the way. And I think we can uh, dive right into this overview of the Kotlin 1.5 highlights. Yeah, let's do it. All right. Yeah, so what are the major highlights of this release? When you work with the uh, calling code, everything should happen smoothly. Idea should be responsive, the compilation should be fast, change to test debug cycle should be really straightforward and also fast, and many things already perform well, and we are actively working on, on improving the others. So now we'll share our achievements for 1.5 and also some plans in this area for 1.6. Also, we'll cover new language features and, the, and some changes uh, both in standard library and Kotlin X uh, libraries. All right. And let me start you folks off because as with all releases, there's mm -hmm. um, a bunch of under the hood changes happening and all of those kind of work together towards one common goal. And that is to improve developer experience. That's probably what you care about. If you're a developer, you want to have a good time when you write Kotlin. So with 1.5, one of these changes is the performance for highlighting and completion improvements. So you can have a quick look at the graphs for our benchmarks here. Now, the absolute values you see uh, on the left are not quite so important uh, because they are just the uh, the internal structure of our benchmarks. But I want you to have a look at the underlying trend. So code highlighting is up to 25% faster um, with Kotlin 1.5 and code completion is up to 50% faster, which is great because that means we can write more Kotlin code more comfortably. You already know, I think we've shared it plenty of time, that uh, the Kotlin team is currently rewriting the Kotlin compiler. This process uh, is uh, not fast. It happens component by component. And when a, one part is available, it becomes um, available in the release, in the Kotlin release. Before checking the current state of this adventure, 
let's reiterate the compiler structure under the hood. How Kotlin compiler manages to convert source code to executables for so many different target platforms? The compiler code consists of two major parts, front-end and back-end, usual words, yes. Front-end analyzes the source code and constructs a so-called intermediate representation of the code, abbreviated IR. IR contains all the information about declarations and types. So, for instance, for foo invocation, it stores and knows where this function comes from, which of the overloaded versions is used, and so on and so forth. So you can think of it as a text compared uh, to ID. When you write code in text, you have no idea what are these types, where these functions come from, and so on and so forth. While ID knows all this information, you can navigate to see the class declaration, the type uh, declaration, the function declaration. And this uh, sort of information is stored in IR. Then this information in IR is used by backhands for generating executables for different target platforms. Actually, this scheme is a little bit simplified because, for instance, intermediate representation is also transformed uh, by the shared code between backends. But for simplicity, it's enough to think of it this way. And then let's now check the state of the different uh, components uh, in the new compiler. Now, currently, this scheme works with the old front end and new front-end is on the way. It's in active development. Uh, we've uh, promised, uh, we've shared uh, that we have the first prototype of new front-end uh, back in Kotlin um, Conf, but it's, yeah, it's a huge project. It takes lots of time. So currently it's uh, in development and it is mainly responsible for the compilation speed up. In 1.5 release, we have the stable JVM IR backend and also the JS IR backend is available in alpha. So I think at this point, mm -hmm. it's probably good to reiterate once again that even though we now have mm -hmm. a stable JVM IR backend, this isn't about mm -hmm. performance changes. It's uh, about consistency. The new front end uh, is going to be what's going to bring the performance improvements. Yeah, so the, the goal of introducing this new IR backends was to share logic between different backends, to simplify the process of supporting new language features. So you kind of use this um, new functionality indirectly. By, uh, so now it's easier for, for the Kotlin team to add and support new language features in different backends, and uh, you are gaining these improve uh, these improvements uh, by observing these changes. All right. So looking at this slide and this table, I, I have a question for you, Sveta. Why is there no native uh, no native IR backend on this slide? Good question. Native uh, backend was IR from the very beginning. At first, JVM and JS started. And they used a different uh, structure, different, uh, there, there was no internal intermediate representation. But starting from native, it was dis uh, decided that it's easier to introduce this intermediate representation so that in the future backends also could use it. So afterwards, uh, other backends started to be rewritten to this IR. All right. And, well, I think a couple of folks in the community also want to know, do we already have any estimations for the new front end? Oh, it's a very good question. But let's reserve this question for Roman when he joins us. All right. Fair enough. Now, I actually want to talk a little bit uh, about how we deliver improvements in, in these kind of areas, right? Because as you folks may know, we deliver these things with, with every single update. And our updates for Kotlin follow our release cadence, which is the plan for when new major versions for Kotlin are released. Um, there's currently the plan to release two major versions per year. So far, well, we've had one in 2021. So, so far, so good. I think we're still on track. Um, 
but we have also now made sure that the Kotlin plugin is a part of the IntelliJ IDEA release cycle. Now, what does that mean specifically for releases? Well, first of all, it of course means that the Kotlin IDE plugin will be released whenever a new Kotlin version comes out, but it will also be updated every time IntelliJ IDEA is released as a new version. And we are going to deliver the major IDE features synchronized with the releases of IntelliJ IDEA. So you can look forward to those as well. Now, a really obvious tip <laughs> from our side, make sure you always use the latest version of IntelliJ IDEA Android Studio because it contains the latest performance improvements and bug fixes. IntelliJ IDEA as a platform is stable as a product and as a, an ecosystem, so probably it's not so critical to have the latest improvements, but the Kotlin plugin is evolving really fast. And if you want to get um, uh, the most out of it, we recommend always updating to the latest version. Yeah, and my little extra tip for this mm -hmm. is uh, if you haven't tried it yet, you can try downloading the JetBrains Toolbox app, which provides a, a very convenient way of managing installations and even multiple versions of IntelliJ IDEA and also Android Studio. So even if something goes wrong during an upgrade, uh, if you have a single button, you can roll everything back but also you can have unattended upgrades so that when you come back to your workstation, you'll always be using the latest version. Okay, um, well, now we know when and how upgrades are delivered. I think it's time to talk a little bit about what the team is actually delivering in this version. Um, there's a couple of stars in this release. Um, I think we should probably take a bit of a closer look. How about you kick us off, Sveta? Yeah, before we start, I want to emphasize uh, that uh, the latest release, if you look closer on it, it's really connected to supporting or making use of the latest JVM features, like sealed classes on JVM or job records, or value classes, uh, which in the future are going to employ the functionality of the Valhalla project. But now let's uh, discuss a uh, couple of these features and start with the uh, sealed interfaces and uh, sealed classes improvements. Okay, so what exactly changes in this release? Because uh, as far as I know, I could have defined sealed classes since Kotlin 1.1 or something. Yes, exactly. But as you can notice, you can now define a sealed interface. It works very similar to sealed class it constrains uh, the subclasses hierarchy. In when, uh, in when expression, the compiler checks that all the, sub, uh, all the subclasses from uh, the hierarchy are present. And if not, and or if you added a new class, it warns you, it gives you an error that uh, this new class is missing. It's really convenient. Another change that you can notice at this slide is that all subclasses of a sealed class or interface can now be in different files, but uh, they should be in the same package and compilation unit. In this example, you see that uh, success subclass in uh, its own file and failure subclass is also in its own file. For such a simple case, there is no need to introduce these extra files, of course. But uh, for more complicated scenarios, uh, when your classes uh, tend to grow, it's really a good idea to extract them into separate files. Yeah, so if I think about my own code, I could probably think of uh, a situation or two where this is going to make uh, my code nice, more, more nicely separate than the previous version. So that's nice. Now, I actually want to talk a little bit uh, about inline value classes. Um, and I want to motivate this with a story from my childhood, from uh, when I was uh, still attending physics classes. Because my physics teacher, he would always ask a question, and when someone gave an answer that was just a number, he would always say, what? What do you mean? He said, if I answer 500, he would say 500 what? 500 buttons, cheeseburgers, kilometers per hour? No one knows. And we have the same problem in programming, right? If I have a function called pay money, and uh, I passed a 500, my physics teacher would scream 500 what? 500 euros, 500, who knows? And of course we have a solution for this, right? Um, we introduce type safety via classes, um, which looks like this. 
uh, but we do pay a small price for it, right? Uh, we allocate an extra object, but in return, uh, we get clarity. We know that it's going to be 500 cents or that we generate uh, 500 cents from the five euros, which is good. But we even have a better solution now with Kotlin 1.5, because if all we want to do is wrap a single other value type safely, uh, we can use value classes. Now, of course, um, we can still do things like provide member and extension functions, but uh, this kind of structure will be desugared at compile time uh, to the prim or to the underlying values, which means you receive the same performance as if you had just used the underlying type directly. Uh, I know for a fact that my physics teacher would probably be a huge fan uh, of this if he's ever writing some Kotlin code. Probably he's writing some code. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? I Who hope is so. now in our community writing Kotlin code? Yeah. Okay, so let's move on and uh, talk about specific platform improvements and start uh, with Kotlin JVM. 1.8 is the new default JVM target. And now Kotlin Compiler uses some of their JVM8 features like inv Invoke Dynamic Instruction for compiling some adapters and Lambda expressions. But note that compilation of Lambdas is so far experimental. First, such Lambdas aren't serializable, as they were before, and to string also becomes less readable. But if your code doesn't depend on that, which is probably true for most of the cases, we recommend trying this flag. Also, Kotlin now processes correctly Java nullability annotations on type arguments, which fixes a number of corny cases in Kotlin Java interoperability. Nice. But of course, uh, Kotlin is more than just the JVM, right? For Kotlin JS, we are currently continuing our journey towards a stable IR backend, uh, which comes with new interoperability with the JavaScript ecosystem and also topics like better code size, faster compilation, uh, and more. And what I would like to highlight specifically here is that even though the backend is currently still in alpha, a lot of libraries are already compatible with this new compiler, so you can try it. This is in part thanks to the work uh, of the folks at JetBrains who made the libraries compatible, but also thanks to you, thanks to our community um, who already went through the troubles uh, of upgrading to the new compiler and, and changing the schemes uh, of how they interop. So if you want to give that a try, it's already possible, um, and we would be excited for you to, to give it a shot. Yep. So let's now talk about Kotlin native improvements. And uh, the Kotlin native team is constantly working on improving performance, both for compilation and execution. And one noticeable improvement in the latest release is related to compiler caches. In the debug mode, the compiler can cache project dependencies, and then the first compilation takes a bit longer, but all the next one are faster. And now more targets are supported for this functionality. Also, the Kotlin team is working on the new memory model. You can check the recent blog post describing the, all the details about it and the, and, uh, the plans. So we expect uh, some prototype, development prototype to be, uh, to be ready by the end of summer, I think. I'm sure a lot of people are very excited about this because that's a, that's a question that's regularly in the Twitter mentions and in our Q&A forms. Um, yep. All right. Yeah, now let's move on to cover libraries improvements, including both standard library and Kotlinx libraries. And let's start with the standard library. Uh, when publishing uh, the blog post, I think, covering this functionality, we made a short survey about which feature you are the most excited about. And um, stable and signed integer type one. But my personal choice would probably go to duration API changes. So now duration stores a uh, long value under, under the hood node double as before. And some other API has changed. And because of that, it's not yet stable, but it's really very close uh, to becoming, becoming stable API of the standard library. Also, there were some improvements um, in character to int uh, conversion. If you imagine you uh, de de declare 
uh, or you have uh, a character storing, I don't know, one digit, and you want to convert it to a number. But if you call just string function, it returns you the utility code of the character and not uh, one, as some might expect. So now this um, case, uh, which caused confusion, is fixed. And now we have two different ways to extract this uh, code property. So you, you use code property if you need this UTF code, or you can use digit to int function that returns you the corresponding digit. So that's um, much more convenient. Yeah, and now the old function uh, is deprecated. Another improvement is about uh, using the modern non-blocking Java IO in a Kotlin Edimatic style now. So it works now kind of out of the box. Okay. So well, I'm glad that you like the the duration changes so much, but I actually have to go with the with the wisdom of the masses here. Um, I'm I'm on the side of of unsigned integer types because I'm very hyped about these as well. Now, in case you haven't seen those before, unsigned integer types are useful whenever you want you want to constrain a number type to contain only non-negative values. Uh, this is particularly useful if you're working on bit and byte levels, so if you're manipulating maybe the pixels in a bitmap or uh, working with other binary formats. Uh, unsigned integer types also have the property that they have a larger positive value range. Uh, so if you look at a regular integer, for example, that goes from minus 2 billion to around uh, about plus 2 billion, uh, whereas an unsigned integer goes from 0 to a little bit over 4 billion. Now, um, these kind of uh, unsigned integer types are also properly integrated with the standard library. So if you want to get a random unsigned integer, uh, the appropriate extension functions are available in the standard library for you as well. And one fun side note for this actually is that this stability is thanks to the fact that we stabilized uh, inline value classes in this release as well. How exactly is it connected? Well, actually, the uh, all the unsigned number types, so whether it's a u byte, u short, u int, or u long, are all implemented mm -hmm. on top of value classes, and they simply wrap the underlying primitive number type. I have another question uh, from this about this slide. Where is the JVM inline annotation? Because yeah. I actually made videos about it. And if you use in, if you want to use now inline classes for JVM, you now define a value class annotated with JVM inline annotation. Of course, the old syntax with inline class also works, but it will be deprecated in some time. So this is new. Recommend a syntax so, but there is no annotation here. Why? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good point. But Sveta, you need to think beyond the JVM <laughs> because this is common code, right? It's it's part of the common standard library, so you can use these unsigned integer types um, on all the platforms that that Kotlin currently supports, mm -hmm. which also makes sense that you don't have a JVM specific annotation on them right here. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. All these features are not only supported for Kotlin JVM, but for other backends as well. And JVM Adline is JVM specific condition. So now let's talk a little bit about Kotlin X coroutines improvements. The concept of delegated BI was introduced. Uh, there were um, added helpful extensions for testing. The channel API was rethought, greatly rethought and improved. And um, also integration with the third-party reactive libraries like RxJava are mostly stable now. In this talk, we won't be able to cover these features in detail, uh, except one on one. Uh, but if you're interested, please check uh, the recent blog post and video by Anton Arhipov, where he explains all this um, about all this uh, functionality. One thing I want to mention, though, is uh, this. Um, Delegated by uh, uh, warning, and because it is a common pitfall, especially for newcomers, using global scope to start new coroutines. The problem is that it breaks structured concurrency. If the entity dies or some problems appear, coroutines are not getting canceled. Cancelled. There are many recommended ways to solve it. You can use the outer scope 
either pass it directly or access a member scope. If a load configuration function, for my example, is a member function, you can make this function suspend and some more. Again, check the detailed explanation by, by Anton. And now to warn you about this, so so that it's, it wasn't only written in docs or uh, taught about uh, in different talks, now that the compiler emits a warning saying this is a delegate API and you should use it with care. So this is a really good caveat preventing you from making mistakes. A really nice challenge took place recently in Kotlin Lang Slack, inventing a better name for delegate API. Like don't try this at home or you will regret using this API. I would also suggest shooting in the foot API. So what's your favorite? I think I have to uh, go with Kirill here. You woke up and chose violence API. Sounds great. If you have more versions, please share them in the YouTube chat now. We'll ask the library team whether they can add a type alias, you know? <laughs> uh, well, let me also talk mm -hmm. uh, a little bit about the changes that came with Kotlin X serialization, which uh, released in tandem with this new Kotlin version. Now, in case you haven't touched Kotlin X serialization before, it's the library you probably want to use for all things communication when you want to turn Kotlin objects into JSON, protobuf, uh, and many more formats. Now, this newest version uh, actually benefits from a completely rewritten encoder and decoder for JSON, meaning it gets up to two times the performance as the previous versions. They also have a bunch of other uh, features like support for value classes and unsigned integers, overhauled API docs, um, and even experimental protobuf schema generation. Now, unfortunately, we don't have enough time to kind of go into all of these things in this overview talk. But there is a video by a guy called Sebastian Eichner, that's me, um, on this very YouTube channel um, about this release. So if you're interested in some more details uh, and some more kind of hands-on approach to this, uh, do check that video out. Yeah, we and uh, uh, blog and uh, YouTube channel covered all the features uh, in detail which we couldn't have uh, explained uh, in this short overview. Um, so you can um, check, uh, you, you can find all the detailed explanations for what we have uh, mentioned, briefly mentioned here, there. Please check them. Yeah, and this also seems like a great situation to become a YouTuber self and say, don't forget to subscribe. Yeah, but I still don't feel comfortable with all this. Subscribe to our channel endings is just everywhere. Let's see how long I can withstand that. You'll you'll change soon enough, but I'll actually do you one better. Make sure you hit that notification bell as well, uh, just to you know really round it out. All right. Well, this actually already concludes the overview of uh, the current version of Kotlin, Kotlin 1.5. So now let's readjust our sights uh, and look a little bit into the future because. As we've seen with the release cadence in the beginning, it's only a matter of time until we trade 1.5 for 1.6. So generally, the official and always up-to-date question to uh, answer to the question of what is next uh, is the official Kotlin roadmap, which contains the team's priorities. It actually even comes with a U-Track board, so you can kind of see the status of individual items practically move around in almost real time. Uh, you can find that on carl.in slash roadmap. Yeah, now it's time to invite Roman to discuss the plans. All right. Let's do it. Hi, Hello, Roman. Everybody. Hi. Hey, Roman. Glad to, Good see, to you. see you. So, uh, Roma, we've shared um, during the time many promises for the future. So let's start with the very first one. Andrei Breslav promised us uh, the new very fast front end back at CottonConf. So you are now responsible for all previous Andrei's promises. What's the state of the new front end? Can you share some details about it? Uh, in, in fact, the new front end is currently uh, the main focus of our team. Uh, and 
uh, in general, uh, the infrastructure, the frontend is a part of the infrastructure of the compiler, is what we're focusing for the next release. Uh, uh, let's take a broader look what this infrastructure is. First of all, there are backends. JVM our backends that we released in 1.5 uh, is released, but it doesn't mean we're stopping working on it. Uh, we still have to fix issues uh, that people find here and there uh, because of this change. Uh, we need to make sure we can just drop the old code completely somewhere post 1.6. And for this, we'll have to make sure like the new one covers exactly everything and has no issues whatsoever. So we can safely drop the flag that will let you switch to the old one. And as uh, you've already mentioned, uh, the release's new JVM backend was not about performance. It was about correctness. We worked hard to make sure it covered with test and behaves as good as the old one. Uh, but and now when it's released, it's, the team is actually starting to look at the performance and uh, we'll see uh, what they can improve uh, for the next release. And then uh, there is also uh, G G JavaScript R backend. We actually originally kind of tentatively planned to make it stable 1.5, uh, but uh, it turned out there is more work uh, to stabilize it. Uh, and the decision uh, was not to make it stable 1.5 because uh, the critical piece of uh, functionality, namely uh, the incremental compilation, wasn't ready. Uh, so now the team is uh, closing this gap so that for the next 1.6 release, they can uh, finish it and uh, make it stable. And then again, it will follow the same tracks. And now uh, let's talk about the front end. Uh, the front end work is full steam working toward the alpha release. And uh, uh, we plan by the end of the year, uh, make a preview that will be alpha so that you can actually start playing with it on your code. And as usually uh, happens with first releases, uh, it uh, won't be completely uh, feature full. Uh, it's, and it's not just because of the difference the way it works. You see the front end is uh, this piece that analyzes your code. So it has to accept both correct code and reject incorrect ones. And this part of analyzing the correct code mostly works. Like front end currently can compile itself. You can feed uh, the compiler to new front end and uh, produce working code. But it's still uh, not, cannot properly with proper messages, reject all the wrong code, report all the diagnostics that you'd expect uh, from a good behaving compiler. And that's big focus of the team uh, to actually uh, finish this. So uh, we can show you a working code and the stabilization uh, uh, of uh, the new front end uh, will be done uh, next year, not this one. And of course we, we have native backend. As, as you know, it was always based on our new IR infrastructure. Uh, but uh, there uh, in native, we're not just doing the compiler, we're also doing the full runtime ourselves uh, because it compiles completely uh, to native code. And in this uh, runtime, we all shared plan uh, uh, to replace memory uh, manager and that's that work uh, continues. Uh, the team uh, is planning to produce uh, a preview uh, by the end of the summer. So that again, uh, somewhere next year, we can have a stable uh, new infrastructure for uh, safely sharing of all the issues, as well as uh, fixing other things like, you know, b b as usual, there's always like every native release is even better uh, interop with native code and stuff like that. That's always like a big theme in, in what we do. So infrastructure is a big thing. But why infrastructure, right? That's, that's a good question. Uh, you see, uh, 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 the, the reason is, uh, first, we, we want to have unified backends. And we're almost there. Uh, the last holdout is uh, uh, JavaScript backend. We work uh, hard to close it. Uh, with the unified backends, we have less code to maintain. Now, if we uh, have to add a feature to language, uh, and, you know, you may be new operator or new syntactic conventions. We used to have to implement it not just in front end uh, to parse it, but we used to have to implement it in all the backends so it's properly uh, desugared and gets compiled to the code. Now, uh, uh, if we add a feature like that, we have to just add a transformation of the intermediate representation once it is almost automatically works uh, on all the platforms. It's also the this unified our backends fixes tons of issues. Uh, for people who are following uh, release notes, you could notice that uh, just release of the uh, new uh, JVM backend closed uh, tons of issues. 
uh, and they were like in Utrecht, in Utrecht, they were closed, uh, had a tag like fixed in uh, GVMR backend, just because it's more regular, it's or better structured with better architecture. Lots of things that were corner cases in the old code, no longer corner cases, they just work. And that, but that's backend infrastructure. And front end, yeah, it's all about performance. The backend is just code unification. Front end, we always had one. We're writing new one just because of performance. The old front end kind of reached its limit on how it uh, faster it can go. And the new front end is re-architectured with performance in mind. Like performance is uh, the key thing. Uh, you might have already heard a preliminary numbers we get. We constantly benchmark um, the new front end and on some benchmark, the front end itself uh, gets uh, four uh, to uh, four times faster on analyzing code. And on full pipeline test, when you feed, uh, com take uh, full compilation front end plus back end, uh, you get uh, from two uh, to two and a half times uh, faster speed. And th that's our short term goal. So, short term goal is to get this done so you can enjoy this performance. And this performance becomes even more important when you work with ID. Like the performance is all impressive in, in just compilation. But when you type code in IDE, uh, the uh, piece of compiler that you interact with is actually a front end. So, speed ups in the front end uh, will uh, uh, result in major speed ups of ID performance, how fast you can get diagnostic from front end completion and everything else. And, but again, this structure is a long term investment. So, we spend a lot of time now, in the end, having the new structure will enable us uh, to easier do uh, new high level features to the language. With a uh, new front end, it's way easier to add synthetic things to the language at higher level constructs that uh, have, uh, for example, effect of in, uh, doing something magical like metaprogramming, stuff like that. New front end enables us to easily add it without again changing code in tons of places. We can just add uh, transformations uh, to the front end IR. Actually, the front end is also the architecture, the way the front end is structured, it's also work with the tree of nodes that's, it has its own intermediate representation that we uh, sometimes, uh, you may hear us referring it uh, to FIR, uh, fear uh, front end intermediate representation. And it is also amendable uh, transformations which allows us in the future uh, to easier implement uh, even higher level uh, features than we have now. So this is actually a good point, Roman, because at our 1.4 online event, you talked about many possible future features in the language. So let's maybe talk a bit about uh, which of these and kind of other features we can expect by Kotlin 1.6 and maybe also what waits for later. Yeah, uh, so the features, when we look at our features, the way we plan, uh, we categorize features in uh, to two major brackets. Some of them like fit in both. Uh, th there could be backend features or frontend features. Uh, uh, to, to get you feel what is a backend feature or frontend feature. So, for example, a backend feature may be uh, uh, some missing uh, interaction with the platform. Uh, or, uh, for example, our suspending, you still cannot extend your classes from suspending uh, functions. Like syntax is there. But it's not implemented on the backend. That's a back would be a backend feature. So it's a missing implementation feature implementation, or for example, a backend feature is um, implementing something uh, on the interoperability layer with a platform. For example, uh, exposing um, new things to Objective C, uh, JavaScript, or GVM, or adding some uh, GVM interop annotations. Uh, that's again uh, backend features that don't uh, uh, don't involve uh, adding new syntax. And uh, when we, if we implement new backend features, it means uh, our effort depends on what kind of backends they go for. So right now, since uh, GVM is running on uh, IR uh, backend and native is on OR backend, it means that we can just uh, implement it once and that's it. But for example, if we now plan for 1.6 to implement any JS uh, backend feature, uh, it means implementing it twice. We'll have to implement for new uh, JS uh, backend and for old JS backend, which is something we really don't want to do. That's why we kind of constrain ourselves to picking only, to not picking like JS backend heavy features so we don't have uh, to spend this effort twice. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at front end, what are 
front-end features. Front-end features is the features that introduce new syntax, uh, new things to type systems, uh, new declarations. And right now in this particular planning timeframe uh, for the uh, half a year until 1.6, implementing new front-end feature means we'll have to implement it twice, both in new front-end and old front, because 1.6 will be still running on the old front-end, but the whole team is busy with the new front. It means we're extremely careful about uh, planning new front-end features. So we've avoided any uh, big uh, front-end features in our, this round of planning to make sure our team can focus on um, infrastructure and not getting distracted with new features. So it means if you actually open our roadmap and by, by the time we, we, we have this uh, event, uh, the roadmap is already public. You can go and actually check it online. Uh, the Kotlin robot phone says, you will notice that most of the features are uh, focused on G GVM backend or kind of leftovers that we need to clean up. It's just uh, Here's just a sample. We, we do things like repeated annotations that mostly uh, concerns GVM, uh, supporting annotations of type parameters that was, again, previously not implemented because of the GVM limitations, uh, like uh, work on uh, new nullability, annotations as part of GSPCFI uh, projects, things like that. So we, tr when we plan features, we uh, try to save our front-end team from doing uh, lots of work so they can complete uh, the front-end that I think uh, most of people are waiting for just to get faster compilation and faster ID. Uh, however, uh, uh, we do want to stabilize things. Ideally, we want to stabilize all the things, but uh, we have to contend with us stabilizing some things. Um, there's lots of unfinished work, even big work, uh, that just been in experimental state for quite a long. So again, we, we've looked at that and uh, picked three uh, big direction for stabilization. First of all, we'll be stabilizing uh, experimental annotations, opt-in mechanism, uh, because it's right now, it's just because it's not that much work left. And it's just funny when you have to opt in into something, you'll first have to opt in into opt-in feature, which is kind of this mind blowing recursion that we definitely want to end. Uh, then we want to stabilize type of, and not because that's a big feature, uh, it's actually mostly used by ourselves inside civilization and some other frameworks use it. So it's kind of this feature you wouldn't usually interact with as an end user. Uh, but uh, it's GVM, all the roadblocks to it, stabilization. So mostly in GVM and with our GVM team being uh, having more free time on their hands with the uh, release of uh, GVM backend, uh, we can stabilize uh, this experimental feature. And uh, there's just one kind of relatively big feature that actually touches front-end that will stabilize that builder inference. Uh, that's kind of technical term. Uh, it, it's used for a type uh, inference feature that uh, you will find in uh, standard library uh, uh, functions like build list and build map. And they're really useful. Uh, lots of uh, good feedback uh, for those versions of the community. We'd love to stabilize those functions. But before doing that, uh, I mean, because it relies on still experimental inference, we want to make this uh, part of inference algorithm uh, uh, stable, and then uh, 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 then we can stabilize our standard library uh, standard library functions. I have one question: What about stabilizing the contracts? Can we expect uh, them to be stabilized? I don't know by Kotlin one point nine. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and the contracts is, there are lots of interesting contracts, but see, uh, to stabilize contracts, it's not just cleaning small things. Like in all these three features, the code mostly done. And to stabilize them, we'll just need to clean here and there, just minor behavioral details, or not so minor, but still. With contracts, there is way more work ahead. First of all, right now, contracts use experimental syntax. The syntax that we currently use to define contracts that you write a contract in the body of the function is not the syntax we want to have in a stable language. That's temporarily syntax uh, we've quickly uh, hacked together uh, to let people and ourselves experiment with contracts. We have already designed uh, the better syntax uh, that we'd like to see contracts rely on that would allow you to attach contracts to open functions, uh, to uh, expect functions, uh, to interface functions, to uh, compose them, uh, grow their syntax. Like 
we've done this design work, but to implement it all, that's going to be uh, to a lot of work in front end. It's new syntax, new uh, syntactic elements, parsing them all. And uh, if we take it on now, that means lots of work from our front end team. Again, every, we, like all of you, want to get faster compiler, faster. Uh, so we'd rather postpone contracts until we were done uh, with uh, new front end and then uh, start stabilizing our contracts. Yes, it's definitely more important. <laughs> <laughs> Having new front end. <laughs> Can't yep. agree more. So, but it, it doesn't mean we're not uh, looking at popular issues. Uh, where your votes do count. Uh, and I, I do ask all the community who, um, who is listening to us right now to actually uh, go and vote for your uh, favorite issues in your track. Uh, because we do watch and what's the most popular in community. And uh, we've picked one uh, very popular issue for this. Uh, uh, particular for two reasons because it, this issue for supporting uh, sealed exhaustive WANs it's on one side very popular I believe it's the second most voted issue out there but in certain sense, it's relatively minor I mean all the uh, solutions that uh, we have in mind that are on the table they involve a little bit of syntax and not that much code in front end however it turns out this feature it is quite hard from the design standpoint we already had uh, one meeting in the team to figure out what ex how exactly we're going to solve it and, and we weren't able uh, to uh, reach a conclusion one sitting so, uh, we've uh, disbanded with a resolution to 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 get more research on the actual code done before we make a final decision on what to do with it but uh, as soon as we decide well uh the implementation itself uh should not uh be uh, very complicated regardless of which uh way we pick and I mean, there's a, the, the kind of the main contention here is do you define uh, exhaustiveness on declaration site on the use site? It, it's basically around it. There are different kinds of use sites, like expressions and statements and stuff like that. And it's like all uh, boils down to all those details. And of course, our naming, like, you know, the hardest problem in computer science is always naming. So, I mean, that's usually in every design discussions, like you can have great design, but then, you know, how do we actually name this thing? How will we name, make really, uh, name this thing that is non-exhaustive do we say non-exhaustive or we do find you know a word that means non-exhaustive what is this word nobody knows stuff like that and yeah and for other beacon from the heavy features uh, they all just like contracts will will have uh to wait for for new front end like with uh you've seen our roadmap that we're working on multiple receivers and we're committed to releasing our design ideas uh, pretty soon and some kind of prototype, but likely the actual integration to the language will happen only with the new front end. Uh, the same goes like uh, issue with statics. That's one of your uh, extensions uh, to other classes. That's the most popular issue right now. Um, things, even uh, seemingly minor things like, you know, private and public property type. That's issue that I've shared uh, on the uh, last talk. Uh, it it requires no design like it's really easy uh has easy syntax but to actually implement it requires considerable work in the front end because right now the front end will have to understand that depending on the context whether you are private the thing can have a different type which is considerable architectural change in the front end which it, there is no feature like that in cotton right now the type does not depend on where you use it from whether uh there, all the entities has a sing, uh, have a single type uh so uh, and other big things that involve syntax, like collection literals, or things like involve type systems, where we all we want to have them all ultimately in the language. But right now, uh, giving our new infrastructure new front is way more important, and we don't want to get distracted from this work. All right. Well, thank you, Roman, for this overview. Um, I think at this point, it's uh, actually time to move on to your questions, if you are still watching. Um, we're also very excited actually to announce that the best questions asked um, will win a couple of Kotlin t-shirts um, and will be in touch with the winners after the event. So if you have a good Kotlin question, make sure to put it in the YouTube chat um and of course if you submitted uh in the google form that we've had beforehand uh, you're also eligible sure so, yeah. good question what t-shirts uh, there will be i have no idea I, <laughs> but I if you saw... missed a kotlin t-shirt there is a chance to get one 
<laughs> yeah, I, I I I saw the images. They look they look very sleek. They look good. All right, so I guess it's time to uh, meet our. I was gonna say Q and A contestants, but that's it's not a competition. But still, let's bring on some some team members and folks, shall we? Yep, and uh, probably stop sharing presentation. And yep, Adam Fox. Um, Hi, folks. Hey, Hi, everyone. Hi. Hey. And we also have people not Hello. only from the Hi. content team. <laughs> well, thanks, Sebastian uh, and Wojtek, who joined us today uh, and uh, agreed to cover all the questions about Spring by Sebastian, obviously, and all the questions about Android by Wojtek. So don't uh, feel free to answer not only the questions related to the Kotlin team, but also the question about Kotlin for server side and Kotlin for Android. We'll be very happy to answer them. So actually, uh, Sveta already said that she really liked duration changes. I really, I said I really liked unsigned integer types in this release. Does anyone else have very strong opinions about a new feature in Kotlin 1.5 that they would like to share with the community to highlight again? Well, no. if you if you could consider Jerem IR backend as a feature, then this would be the one because we're finally close to dropping the old backend. Same for me, actually, because it unlocks the use for, of Jetpack Compose. It's it's you know a precondition for using Compose, so it will be the the new backend for me as well. All and, right. And on Spring side, we we are waiting for uh, some bug fixes that require uh, the new backend. So that's that's also our priority. I'm really oh. happy with the string changes. So hopefully, all the console application will now work on Turkish like uh, without any problems. If it was actually quite a long-standing pain for us and for JVM as well, for Java ecosystem as well, I suppose. I All personally right. like sealed interfaces. That's I, I believe that's the issue I created like a few years ago when I ran on on top of it somewhere. And this is this is actually a, a great uh, a great segue, Roman, because we have a question here, which is. What is the purpose of sealed interfaces? Where where do these excel? See, uh, they excel when you start modeling uh, your data types with sealed class. For example, I'm writing a really simple pet project. So I have client server, I have um, communications uh, between them. Some messages go in one direction from server to client, others go the other direction. So I create a class, uh, a sealed class, that, uh, and then inherit all the kinds of messages from it. That's great. But now, uh, you know, some messages go only from server to client, others the other direction, or but some of them go both. So how do I make sure that on server and client I handle all the all of them and don't miss any? So what I with silt interfaces, I I can um, have a server message interface and client message interface that's implemented only by the appropriate message, and some message may implement both. And then on server side, I can have a variable uh, with type. Uh, server message and I can do when uh, and make sure my compiler will uh, tell me if I missed to handle any server message on the server side and the same on the client side. And, you know, it's just one simple example, but people who actually uh, uh, use types to do rich modeling of the domain constantly run in into those. All right. Since we started with features, uh, there were several questions about uh, JVM uh, inline or, or just inline classes. Uh, just a minute of advertisement to have in our YouTube channel and we prepared a separate uh, YouTube videos about uh, this functionality, but it never is bad to repeat <laughs> the major stuff. So uh, uh, we can answer like a couple of questions and actually there are very interesting questions uh, not covered there about uh, supporting a uh, new features that was probably about inline classes but uh, there might be separate question uh, similar questions about other functionality um, for so slava can you probably comment uh, on how easy or hard it was for you to support the same functionality in kotlin native and uh, whether there is a question whether you encounter some interoperability problems in Objective C specific to value classes or sealed classes, so can you probably uh, share some lights about it? 
Sure. Well, for the first part, uh, supporting query classes in Kotlin Native was uh, actually trivial because we had this support for a long time because query classes were known as inline classes before that for a couple of years. Uh, as for interoperability problems, yes, we do have them and we have some plans to improve to interoperability with the uh, very classes from Swift. That's all. Okay. Um, so there's a couple of questions, um, as usual, around coroutines, and some of them around coroutines themselves, some of them also uh, especially in, in connection with, uh, with Android. So maybe to Wojtek, um, will mutable flow replace live data? Uh, so I suppose this question is about mutable state flow, which is probably the most similar to live data. And um, the answer is, yes, it's very similar. And we are work working to make it easier uh, for people using Kotlin and Android to be able to completely replace live data with state flow and similar um, um, type of things, uh, but you don't need to do it. Um, it. Live data is not going away anytime soon. Uh, it will still remain available for anyone who is uh, maybe writing apps in the Java programming language and not Kotlin. Uh, so it's not like you know we're giving you a date you have to migrate. Uh, however, if you wanted to use Flow throughout all layers of your app, um, use all the power of Flows, including you know using suspend functions and operators and so on then we we are just releasing a new set of APIs that will make it slightly easier to do. Uh, so look out for uh, for the new Lifecycles KTX library that is in alpha. And um, hopefully, you'll be able to replace the, the last usages of live data with state flow. OK. OK, um, question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, a question to. Uh, probably Stas also kind of reiterating what uh, Roman already shared, uh, but still probably um, uh, pro pro probably you can share also some uh, details of uh, how uh, overall this uh, faster this speed up in you front end uh, IR is achieved. So it's like. Uh, why do we now have this uh, promise speed up and uh, what are the major um, kind of uh, reasons behind it? What are the major achievements? <clears throat> or just well, writing from scratch? <laughs> well, basically, we're just rewriting from scratch the front end. And it's uh, right now responsible for 70% of the time compilation. So when you... Um, well, rewrite this part and make it a lot faster than before, then you, of course, uh, speed up the whole compilation process. So basically, uh, with the new front end, it would be like 2 or 2.5 times faster than uh, previous compilation time. And there is no magic, uh, basically. We just know all the bad things that was done in the previous version of the front end. And we tried to not uh, do them again. All right. So we also got a, a question for uh, Sebastian. Uh, great, great name, by the way. I need to keep saying that. Um, we got the new, <laughs> we got the new value or inline classes now with Kotlin 1.5 alongside some other um, Kotlin features. Uh, will those work fine with uh, Spring, for example? So currently uh, not, uh, because there is some uh, interoperability, interoperability issue. Basically, uh, uh, when Kotlin is using some uh, Java valid construct, it's easy to be supported. Here, it seems to be more involved. So I expect that uh, we will uh, yeah, continue our collaboration and maybe work uh, on that for future version, uh, especially between Spring Data Team and uh, uh, your Kotlin team. But yeah, I, I think that would be very interesting to to um, to support. But uh, I'm not sure yet if that uh, should be via changes on Spring side, uh, changes on Kotlin side, or both. So we need to, to discuss. But typically, this kind of interoperability um, uh, question need to be solved. And I, I'm really looking forward to uh, supporting inline classes uh, in Spring. OK. 
So the next uh, question uh, should probably go to Nastya. Uh, sorry, Nastya, because I think that uh, there are just uh, the same questions asked again and again, but I think it's important for us to ask them again and again. So <laughs> it's uh, no hurt. Uh, the question is uh, from Anna, and do you have any plans to support Common UI in Kotlin Multiplatform Mobile? <laughs> Okay, let's answer that question once and for all. <laughs> well, not sure that once and for all, but at least <laughs> ask me again. Uh, yeah, we would love to have great common UI framework for Kotlin Multiplatform and for Kotlin Multiplatform Mobile specifically. Uh, the problem is, uh, to be honest, we are not great mobile developers. If you need a great compiler, yes, come to us. If you need a great IDE support, yes, we can do that. But to write a great cross-platform UI framework, let's be honest, we are just simply not up to the task yet. And maybe it will happen in the future. Maybe we will do it. Uh, but I don't know. I hope that while we are working on Kotlin native concurrency or some other issues, cross uh, cool cross-platform UI will just happen. <laughs> That's basically All right. It. The community right. you heard us, <laughs> you heard our uh, <laughs> indirect <laughs> suggestions. <laughs> If you're thinking of what frameworks you want to implement, please consider this opportunity. Yeah. So speaking of uh, frameworks you might want to implement, I'm just going to ask myself a question here, and that is the, about the state of Jetpack Compose in multi-platform projects. Um, that's it's the best thing. If you're a moderator and you also know about the topic, it's, it's amazing because you can just squeeze yourself in. Um, so yeah, we uh, in case you did not know, uh, Jetpack Compose or generally Compose um, has has made the leap um, away from Android or, or beyond Android, um, and we are now building um, Compose for desktop, and also recently opened up a uh, Compose for web technical preview, so you can check that out uh, if you're interested in sharing UI code between those platforms. Uh, and because I know the follow up questions are gonna be in the chat, like. The moment I say this, we do not have anything to announce regarding Jetpack Compose for iOS. The next question that we had um, from um, that, we, that we can ask uh, probably goes to Wojtek, but probably someone from the team also wants to comment on that. Android is not fully Java compatible. Is it safe to use uh, new Kotlin features? currently available for and new functionality available for, for the newest target and probably some comments about about this change for new default target. Yep. Right, so it should be safe. Um, we do have the sugaring in our uh, tool chain. So during the build, we the sugar some of the features that are maybe not available on other devices and kind of make them work through various transformations. Uh, we also support some of the APIs that were introduced in newer Java versions, uh, also through the sugaring, so, so that your code doesn't require actual Android updates uh, for these to work. Uh, but as for actual compatibility issues, maybe someone from the Kotlin team knows if there's a, there are any outstanding problems that we need to fix. As far as we know, everything works smoothly. With Android and new Kotlin, so it's safe to use any anything new. Just make sure you you've enabled the sugaring. All right, fair enough. Um, Ilya asks an interesting question: Are there any plans to build an alternative to JNI for uh, Kotlin on the JVM? No, there is no such plans. Moreover, the, the Java team works on Project Panama, which has a newer, better GNI with a much better inter interoperability layer. So we're just going to leverage it and to provide shiny new Kotlin API over it. And the, and the task is done. So let's just wait for new versions of Java. All right. And another question going directly to Seva is about a uh, thing that is often asked uh, by the community is about Project Loom. It's like, uh, have you already tried it? What's, how it impacts uh, coroutines? 
Uh, also, there was some question in the chat how it uh, how now it's um, uh, it's like how to, how uh, Java fibers will handle fiber context and so on and so forth. So, can you okay. please comment on it's, that? It's quite similar to multi-platform UI framework um, JetBrain, in JetBrains and Kotlin. So yes, we obviously keep track of it and keeping our hands on pools. But the problem is um, the project loom evolves pretty fast. So they're not targeting any release yet. So we, we don't really know what the final API will be. The basic idea is pretty simple and we know how to integrate with it, how to integrate with fibers and how to leverage them. For example, we will be able to reuse thread locals, which, um, which is now far from perfect in coroutines. We'll know how to avoid excessive suspensions or context switches, but regarding, for example, coroutine scopes and fiber scopes, we don't know yet because like a month ago, there was a concept of fiber scope, but now, now it's gone. So yes, we keep track of it, but we don't know yet. We're just waiting for, for the loom to at least to be in the preview state in any Java version. Okay. So I'm going to combine two questions here. Um, which is the question of how the unsigned types um, and value classes are represented on the JVM, and also are value classes located on the stack instead of on the heap? Okay, that's, let's say, a tricky question. Um, value classes are represented as the, most of the time as the carrier type. For example, for unsigned int, uh, they're represented just as plain int in JVM, uh, as long as you don't put it in any generic generic type like array list where the type erasure kicks in. And they're located, well, when it's a local variable, they're located on stack. And when you put them in, I don't know, any type, then yes, they're located on heap. OK. Um. So here's another interesting question. Um, are you looking to natively support Java style builders for data classes? Yeah, I mean, the Java style builders for data classes, uh, it's kind of really crazy idea. Why would you want to have Java style builders in Kotlin? <laughs> I mean, the uh, so, and what does it mean natively is also not clear. How, uh, the, the, the thing, however, we do plan to improve Kotlin style builders. Right now, if you want to build your class with a Kotlin uh, style builder, it means writing a bit of boilerplate, basically. You have to define your builder function and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, uh, and pe pe people do this so often that there are even uh, open source projects uh, to automate this. Uh, there's a project called AutoDSL that does this for you, like creates your Kotlin style builders automatically. And that's something that may end up in the language, but Java style builders, definitely no plans. Okay. There were some proposed uh, questions for Sebastian. Uh, is there, uh, like, can you share about uh, plan of work to increase the adoption of Kotlin for server-side development is like from your side. I think that we can also share what we are doing, but uh, you probably can uh, share something about it yeah, from the Spring perspective. Yeah, sure. Uh, first, we, we have a close collaboration with the Kotlin team, with Roman and the whole team to, uh, to fix. Um, uh, we, we have a, some latest uh, blockers, like, uh, for example, we have issues with uh, uh, free and generic APIs that prevent to use a web desk client API in Spring, but other uh, free and API uh, in the JVM ecosystem. So we, we, we try to collaborate with uh, the Kotlin team to make sure it will be fixed. Um, we have recently, um, so the Kotlin team and some members uh, that are now working in the Spring team has written a, a coroutines tutorial. So in addition to the regular GPA, um, uh, Kotlin tutorial to build a Spring Boot application. Uh, there is a tutorial about how to use uh, AirSocket coroutines API, WebFlux, and the coroutines support that we chip uh, with Spring Boot. 
So I think that's a that's a pretty interesting one. Um, we we try to make sure that uh, it's also working well with um, uh, with the multi-platform support. So really, I my point of view is that. Uh, uh, Java continue to evolve. It tried to provide more features like records, but in practice, when you use really the language to build concrete applications, I really think that Java limitations uh, remain uh, really annoying, like uh, you can't extend uh, records or things like that. So um, I, I, I continue to think that Kotlin keeps a, a true advantage in terms of language, but that's not enough to get uh, to get to the next level. Uh, so leveraging more multi-platform uh, is super important. Uh, so we continue to refine the Kotlin initialization support. I guess in the future we will add support for more data types, but uh, leveraging uh, multi-platform support to share mode code be between the server side and the front end, for example, um, uh, with Kotlin GS, uh, maybe later Kotlin WebAssembly is, is something that uh, could significantly increase um, the market share on server side. Uh, because that's that's really a place where Java can't uh, compete. And there is also a more long-term, uh, another long-term topic, which is using more uh, DSLs uh, to configure Spring. Uh, so you may be aware that uh, I have launched a few years ago the Spring Foo project. Currently, it's a little bit in pause mode because I'm working a lot on the uh, GraalVM native image support for supporting both Java and Kotlin. Uh, and I have instant startup and, and low memory footprint. But uh, while working on this project, we are working on some stuff that will make uh, Spring Foo more maintainable and more first class. So I, I still think that yeah, for Kotlin, uh, getting more DSL to configure Spring Boot is the right way uh, to do it uh, for the long term. But yeah, that, uh, that takes time. So Sebastian, you, you said uh, that you're working on, on Kotlin, for example, for GraalVM. Do you want to give like a, a shot, uh, like what's what's currently state of the art? Because I've, I've seen the word GraalVM for server side a couple of times in our forums as well. Yeah, yeah. And uh, in fact, there is some improvement in Kotlin 1.5 that improve uh, the GraalVM native image support. Uh, so I'm very glad that we have that so now chipped in Spring Boot 2.5. So Spring Boot 2.5 has been released uh, uh, last uh, last week, and it's uh, it's using Kotlin 1.5 by default, uh, and it's it's uh, coming with some Kotlin uh, with some native image support improvement, and basically um, uh, our support for GraalVM native images is provided by Spring Native. It supports two languages, Java and Kotlin, and it allows basically to compile your uh, Spring Boot application here developed with Kotlin, for example, to a native executable that does not require the JVM to run. Um, it mainly brings two advantages, instant startup and reduced memory consumption. It's different uh, from Kotlin native because uh, it's allowed to reuse the JVM ecosystem. So you can continue to use Spring or use JVM library uh, with some uh, sometimes additional configuration, while Kotlin native requires to use it is more yeah for mobile uh, these days. And even for server side, it's it's require using the, the C, uh, C uh, ecosystem. So that's uh, that's a different. I get that's that's why I'm usually talking about that as uh, Kotlin slash JVM slash native platform because that's a way to do native uh, with the JVM ecosystem. And for for server side, uh, that's that's what we we target. Um, okay. Following uh, the server side topic, I've just. Uh, search through the questions about Kator, and there are a couple that uh, I can easily answer. <laughs> they are not um, about uh, something in depth, but uh, there were just a couple of questions about documentation. Yes, we are updating it. It's, uh, it's like in the process, and we are actually also working on creating sort of learning path for it, so it's uh, in progress. And also there was a separate questions about videos. Uh, so you've probably noticed that we have some Kotlin for Spring videos on our channel, and um, some might uh, ask uh, when we uh, will start to create uh, Kotlin for Kater videos. And the answer is uh, because we know that the great rename is coming, which is exactly renaming feature to plugin, that we will need to update all the video content after this rename. And you know, it's really hard to update videos. So we've decided to follow the easy path and <laughs> wait until the rename, it, uh, the exact rename happens. 
Mm -hmm. That seems fair mm -hmm. enough. Mm -hmm. Now I have a, a question for Anastasia. Um, mm -hmm. So if I currently have both an iOS app and an Android app, and I want to try Kotlin multi-platform mobile, do you have any suggestions on how to kind of experiment with it or, or kind of get started with it? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, the rule is actually pretty simple. Start small and expand from there. A uh, good candidate for those first touches are usually internal utilities, for example, logging or internal analytics for big applications or some complex algorithms, some complex business logic calculator, something like that. And the next step is usually networking and data management. And a couple of steps from there is common UI, which we don't have yet. So <laughs> that's basically it. Also, we have a good tutorial uh, for just this case about making Android application cross-platform, about extracting common logic from Android and iOS applications, and then reusing it in the platform parts. All right. Probably or more questions uh, to Nastya. Also, I think that uh, the questions uh, pop up really frequently <laughs> in our uh, forums and uh, chats. Uh, would you now, mm, like, uh, when would you now suggest to use it in production? Uh, so it's like in which circumstances uh, for the folks, uh, it will be a safe go? What would be your recommendation? Uh, well, to be honest, I hate this question about production readiness because I instantly want to talk with the person about their case. So, okay. So talk to Nasta if you <laughs> want to use it in production. <laughs> the answer is talk to Nasta. And... Yeah, for now, uh, if uh, I'm allowed to be heavily opinionated, uh, KMM is definitely production ready for you. If you have engineers with Android and iOS expertise on the team, if your case is well beneficial uh, for KMM usage, for example, you have complex business logics or your apps are pretty big or, uh, well, I don't know, you just want to make some uh, refactoring to fix bugs uh, quicker and easier, etc. It's probably not as production ready as we would like it to if you are a single developer and uh, if you want to make a quick prototype or things like that. And then there are a lot of cases in the middle and, well, can't answer no uh, can't answer to a question not knowing the particular case so if you are somewhere in the middle just come talk to me i'm always happy to chat about coffee of the platform now we organize lots of your interviews for nastya <laughs> that would be about great cases. <laughs> yeah but actually feel free to come to us to connect to us especially if you have specific questions you know kotlin lang slack I think is the would be the easiest uh, place where you can just type the name and uh, write the message directly. Yeah. Um, so Piers actually asks an, an interesting question. So they say, well, sometimes we see new Kotlin artifacts already on Maven Central, but there's no communication, there's no tweets, there's no blog posts yet. What's up with that? Well, this one on, is on me. Well, basically, uh, they usually publish uh, Kotlin artifacts before the um, well market communication or, or post on Twitter. Well, by, by obvious reason. It, uh, but this time, after the publication, we realize that we have some problems with uh, ID plugins, and we 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 need to fix them. That's why uh, the actual release was postponed uh, for a bit. OK. I think that's a, that's a good enough explanation. <laughs> so always wait until the blog post is published. <laughs> then that means that yeah. Kotlin then is you, released. Then you're and on also, the page site. Yeah, and, and also, sometimes we need the release on uh, Marine Central before to prepare our own libraries mm -hmm. to recompile them with the new compiler. So sometimes it could be uh, done on purpose. All so, right. Yeah. 
There is another question uh, to Sebastian, I think, uh, about using Kotlin Spring uh, with the functional style, uh, like a cater or like other solutions using functional style. Do you want to comment some something about it? Yeah, so I think there is two two main ways to do that. You can use uh, your regular Spring Boot application, and you can add uh, and uh, some functional DSL there. So you can write your uh, web routes uh, with uh, with uh, web uh, router uh, DSL that is provided with Spring. Uh, you can uh, create your bins with the functional bin uh, definition DSL that we provide, and everything is is supported production ready and, and fully integrated into Spring Boot. So here, this is the easiest path, but usually you start like that, but you are mixing also that with add configuration at uh, yeah, uh, the annotation programming model. So if you want to go the extra mile, uh, you can try the Spring Foo project. Just be aware that that's an experimental project uh, and we do not cover all the um, um, all the scope uh, of Spring Boot and it's it's not production ready, even if I know that uh, some folks are using that in production because underneath that really Spring Boot. So in practice, that's pretty pretty safe. But yeah, don't expect the level of documentation support, etc. And I, I currently we are um, yeah we are working on the engine underneath to make everything maintainable. Uh, and I think we will start again moving uh, faster on uh, increasing the scope on Spring Foo um, next year. Uh, but uh, right now we are doing some, yeah, like uh, like the work you are doing on the on the back end and the front end. We are we are less low level, but we we need to do some cleanup in order to move faster in a more maintainable way. So that's that's what we are doing right now. Okay. So Mohamed asks um, about the direction of Kotlin's type system uh, and in which directions where we can expect to see it next and especially what aspects, uh, for example, expressivity, soundness, graduality, flow sensitivity, reification, uh, what kind of these topics uh, you would like to see improved most or next, I guess. Uh, yeah, I, I can answer that. Uh, th there are lots of you could improve, uh, and it, it all boils down uh, to pragmatics. Uh, because Kotlin, first and foremost, is a pragmatic language, so we'll look what are, are missing features you uh, you uh, s stumble into in uh, actual production. And we'll also look at the how um, expensive that in terms of annotation uh, so, and type system to actually fix. And you know, there is uh, countless research into type system. Like you can go as far as you can in expressing things in your type system. But the, the, the problem, the farther far you go, the, the, uh, there's some more, there's a place where you cross the threshold of uh, having actually require more upfront work from developer than uh, bringing them benefit even, even with uh, type inference. So uh, in terms of what we're actually looking at, uh, the closest uh, uh, big is, if I can say so, improvement uh, to the types we're looking at is uh, addition of uh, uh, denotable union intersection types. And uh, that's, uh, of course, cannot be expressed uh, in the Java type system cleanly, but we're all kind of already well past uh, uh, the worry about being uh, um, a 100% Java compatible in every new feature we introduce. So. It's kind of as the Kotlin ecosystem grows, uh, our goals has shifted. So as originally Kotlin was mostly uh, uh, Java compatible in all the features it has. And, but we've over time introduced coroutines, introduced uh, inline classes that are not directly Java compa compatible. Our goals has shifted into uh, working cleanly with all the Java code and frameworks that you have. So you can still use your uh, Java libraries, but we're not scared of of adding features that uh, in Kotlin you would benefit from, but may not be um, easily used uh, in the other direction from uh, Java. And union intersection type would fall into these directions. And it's actually, in fact, even though we're still far away from full-blown union intersection type, that will happen uh, not even with a uh, new frontier release somewhere. We'll even start in work uh, on that uh, just uh, uh, somewhere after we finish the new front end. But we're adding bits and pieces into type system even now. For example, in 1.6, we've planned a minor improvement where you can express 
non-nullability in type system, which is actually uh, uh, T and any, this, this kind of restricted intersection that was not expressible before, will be, you'll be actually be able to express this uh, in 1.6. So we're, I mean, small tweaks are always happening uh, as just minor features. All right. Thanks. So, uh, so there's uh, our, our our good friend Sebastian here. Unfortunately, needs to leave in a little bit, but I still want to to ask him to maybe elaborate a little bit on on what's what's happening next with uh, uh, Spring Boot 2.6. Yeah, so um, not everything is defined yet, but we are uh, collaborating with the Kotlin team to uh, tentatively provide the Spring Boot documentation in Kotlin in addition to Java, like we did uh, with Framework previously. Um, I, I think our uh, our long-term goal is really to provide, um, uh, yeah, uh, Spring experience natively in Kotlin. Do not have to, do not have to translate from Java to Kotlin, uh, and a lot of people have appreciated the fact that we translated the whole uh, Spring framework documentation from Java to Kotlin, and um, yeah, we 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 plan to do the same in collaboration with the Kotlin team for 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 the upcoming Spring Boot 2.5 2.6 release. Uh, so I hope that will that we make it. Yeah, I can confirm that we have some plans <laughs> to help with <laughs> continuifying some parts of the docs. OK, and thanks for, thanks for helping. And I, I would like to thank the Kotlin team for the great mm -hmm. collaboration. Uh, that's uh, that's nice to be able to, to to refine all these small bits like documentation, uh, compatibility, et cetera, that, that really matters for, for developers. Yeah. We thank would like to much. once again say, yeah, thank you for coming on today and answering a couple of questions. I'm sure the community found it uh, very helpful. My pleasure. Bye. Thank All right, you. Take care. Nice question. Nice question. Every time someone says Sebastian, I, I always get like a little bit nervous that I have to and, answer uh, a question say, next. Say bye, Sebastian. Yeah. yeah. I always like, say bye, Sebastian. Now I have to leave. Well, Sveta, do we actually have a question that I could answer? Um, there was some. <laughs> uh, I saw it uh, somewhere. Uh, to speaking about not just target. <laughs> I'm I'm open for whatever. For whatever. Okay. Uh, do you know anything about not just target? It works quite well when running locally, but having to distribute the not just app seems not that straightforward, at least for the legacy backend. Okay. Well, good thing that I have my killer answer for these kind of problems. Mm -hmm. That is, I'm sure it'll all be better. With a, with a new IR backend, uh, if you have particular problems, uh, of course, please do reach out in the in the Kotlin Lang Slack uh, because we are, uh, especially in in regards of redesigning um, the the interoperability with the with the JavaScript ecosystem. Uh, this is a big change that comes with the IR backend, um, so we're interested in your feedback and your use cases as well. Uh, that's unfortunately as as concrete as I can get because I'm not really sure what exact problems you're facing. Um, I do see one one fun question here, uh, and that is, what uh, are the new developments uh, that will come in the next version of uh, Compose for Desktop? Uh, and for that one, I can only say stay tuned, because I'm writing that release blog post right now. So it's, it's not going to take too long, um, and you'll maybe you'll you'll find right some now, cool during the event. Well, you not, also able to write well blog before post. the event and after the well event. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> not a multitasker. Okay, uh, now I want to ask a question to Slava. There was, uh, it's, it's like, okay, we know that the Kotlin uh, native team uh, will 99% uh, probably be working on new memory model, uh, but there are some, uh, but there is a question uh, about improvements with, for Swift and generics. Can you comment on the plans for that? Yeah, sure. First, this is on our radar, but uh, because of new garbage collector, it's hard to devote too much time uh, on this. Uh, but uh, as I already said, we consider experimenting with better support for value types when importing Kotlin to Swift. It's not clear yet. It's not uh, like uh, some commitment with milestone, but we have this on mind. And if you have some, some, something specific in your minds, please let us know through whatever channel you prefer. All right. 
Um, so here's an interesting question about uh, Kotlin X serialization. Do you have any plans for adding built-in support for top-level lists or arrays? Well, it's actually already supported, so just try it out. Amazing. So how do people use that then? Because apparently well, it seems to be hard to discover for them. Just pass <laughs> a JSON instance and you're done. Nothing special required, required for that. A JSON instant. All right, Julian. Now you know it. Now you know that the support's already there. No need to wait. OK, some questions uh, for Wojtek. Yeah. Uh, so here, so uh, we are, uh, Wear OS is apparently merging with uh, Tizen. I don't want to use .NET. Uh, can you help, please? So there was some, uh, not probably a question, <laughs> but <laughs> something to comment on. Right, so we made some announcements about how we're planning to modernize uh, the Wear uh, ecosystem mm -hmm. together with uh, Samsung. Mm -hmm. And uh, that doesn't mean that you're going to have to learn a completely new way to create apps for Wear or use a completely different language. In fact, we are releasing new APIs um, in you know, the Java, Java programming language. We're going to continue with Kotlin support for um, uh, whatever it makes sense, mm -hmm. such as adding coroutines and mm -hmm. in places where it makes sense. So uh, don't worry. Um, nothing's, there's no major change. You're going to be able to use the same SDKs, Android SDKs, as, as previously. There's so just going to be more and better APIs. Thank you. And uh, the next question uh, also sort of about Android, but probably someone from the Kotlin team also wants to comment on that. How, uh, what are the plans to optimize Android build performance with KSP? Right, so KSP is the, a tool that um, some engineers from Google are working on that um, it will potentially be able to replace CAPT, so K-A-P-T. Uh, so it'll be useful for uh, people working on annotation processors um, that need to parse some code and then maybe generate some other code that will be used by, by your build. And because KAPT was made specifically for the JVM ecosystem, it needs to do a little bit more kind of overhead work that we're trying to eliminate with uh, KSP. Um, and the good thing is KSP is nearing completion and it'll be available for use uh, soon. Uh, currently, it's still an alpha, but we're quickly moving towards the next phases. The bad news is that actual plugin authors have to migrate their plugins to use KSP. So it's not like the end user can just you know, switch over in their build and start using KSP. It's the library authors, the annotation processor authors that have to migrate to KSP. Uh, we're doing that with some of our annotation processors, such as the one used by Room. And we're already seeing a lot of uh, build speed improvement. Um, but you know, it's it's up to the community really to um, adopt this new tool, and then uh, once people are able to actually remove KAPT from their build, then they will see the build improvements. Hopefully, I don't know if anyone else has anything to add here. I can add that we have really a very frequent question: What is the future of Capt? And I think that Kotlin team now can confirm <laughs> that uh, KSP is the future of Capt. Yeah, and, and basically, uh, there was some question about uh, KPT performance could be improved or mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. And we tried that uh, and we discovered that, well, because of the infra in infrastructure and how CAP actually works, it's impossible for us to improve that further. And the only way is just, well, migrate to KSPT, and that is the future. <laughs> And also, yeah, the, uh, we expect uh, support for Kotlin multi-platform. So it's like, and the Kotlin multi-platform, as we know, is our future. <laughs> so it all makes total sense. Um, can you folks maybe quickly contrast um, the difference between KSP and like compiler plugins or just generally the, the idea of having a compiler API just so that people are kind of on the same page? Yeah, sure. Well, basically, the KSP is is like annotation processor. So you, you could just iterate through your, your code and, well, add some stuff. With the compiler plugins, you, you have another 
picture in mind. You should have another picture in mind. You should operate with internal structures of the compiler itself, like a backend IR or, or something like that. And it's a lot um, more complex and low level API for, for the users. So for the easiest, uh, like for, so basically it's recommended for you to use uh, KSP or something like that and use compiler plugin only if you want to create something very complex and or very performance optimized or something like that. And uh, the question kind of related to that, will the compiler plugin API be part of the changes to new front end? Well, first of all, right now we do not have the compiler API. I mean, we, we have some extension points to our compiler, but all the API is, well, not stable, not documented and so on. Uh, and actually there is several parts of this future API of the compiler. One is for the backend. And right now we kind of have the good picture of how it will work because right now we have uh, three backends, all of them use the same internal representations. You could manipulate with it and so on and so forth. But with the front end, right now there is very few, uh, almost none uh, extension point for the front end itself. And in the future, we would like to introduce it together with the new front end. So you could manipulate with the new front end uh, in internal structures. So definitely not before the new front end. Everything waits for new front end. Features wait for new front end. Performance waits for new front end. Compiler API waits for new front end. We all are waiting for new front end. And the new front end team especially waits uh, until they can do something else. No pressure on the front end team. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's not totally true because we could introduce the backend, uh, only backend API first, so you could manipulate uh, backend IR through a compiler plugin. And we will, once we'll release all our new IR based uh, backends, because right now there is still uh, JS IR backend under the development. All right. Thank so, you. yeah. I have a question for you, Sam. <laughs> oh, for me? Okay, go right ahead then. Uh, any plans for Kotlin WebAssembly support? Uh, <laughs> or what are the plans for Kotlin WebAssembly support? Yes. Um, uh, that was the answer. <laughs> yeah. We're, I mean, we're still a long way out, um, but we're, we're working hard behind the scenes to provide you with something to play with uh, as, as soon as possible. But uh, my trademark uh, is, of course, no ETAs. Uh, no dates, no guarantees, but things are happening, uh, and we are internally very excited about this. Of course, because it's a um, it's a really exciting target for for Kotlin to to bring it to to the browser and just WebAssembly runtimes in general um, beyond beyond JavaScript. So yeah, that is uh, that is definitely in the future somewhere. Can add a shame, shameless commercial plug. We are hiring into the Kotlin uh, WebAssembly team, actually, and you can find the vacancies on the JetBrains website. That is right. Uh, so we can definitely check out uh, jetbrains.com slash careers um, if you want to join uh, our teams. Uh, there's a lot of folks here, and I'm sure as everyone here can attest to, it's uh, very interesting and very exciting work. You don't have to speak Russian, really. Yeah. It's not also, <laughs> also that I don't speak Russian. All works fine. I I have I have one more question um, from Sayed, uh, and that is: Are we going to see any better support for reflection in other Kotlin targets? Uh, yeah, I can answer that. That's that's uh, you, first of all, we'll definitely uh, have minor improvements in uh, Kotlin reflection for other targets. Like there are missing uh, small things, uh, like I don't know, getting fully qualified class name on Kotlin JS that will be supported. But we don't have any near term plans to support full blown, uh, or as we call it, just full reflection on other targets uh, beyond GVM because uh, full reflection is kind of this escape hatch that lets you do anything. 
but the price you pay is extremely high. The price you pay in very large binary size and ability to optimize uh, the results in code by the runtime. So instead of any reflection, we're actually looking at what uh, things people are trying to achieve with reflection, how we can uh, provide different solutions that do not involve adding full-blown reflection uh, to the Kotlin platform. And that's actually the general way apply to every feature request. So whenever uh, uh, anyone asks, can we have a feature X from this other platform language in Kotlin, uh, you will always expect us to ask, but well, what exactly you're trying to achieve with this feature request? And maybe can we, uh, there are other solutions uh, to uh, uh, let you achieve this that are maybe more performant or easier to use or just uh, uh, fit better into Kotlin language. And the same goes with reflection. Yeah, and what can be solved with language features can be solved with compiler plugins. So again, waiting for front-end team. All right. Like, for example, serialization in JVM, it mostly requires a reflection in JVM-based frameworks, but serialization works purely through the compiler pl plugin API and doesn't use reflection in runtime. OK. I think another uh, popular question uh, to Nestor is like, what uh, does team want to do uh, to, you know, move the st status, the label of status of uh, KMM to alpha to another letter, probably a bit better. I'm uh, not asking when. It's like we never. <laughs> I, I I learned myself that I should never, never, never talk about dates. <laughs> but it's more about uh, what what are there. What do you want to do? What what the team wants to do? Uh yeah, sure. Well, first of all, uh, let me answer just like uh, Seb did a couple of minutes ago. We will have a blog post about that, and we are writing it right now. Uh, but since it will come a little bit later. Uh, uh, I can elaborate a bit on that, I guess. Uh, inside the team, we have this intuition of when things go better or stable, and we call it what the hell per seconds. If you're experienced, what the hell if your application is already written and is in production, for example, if uh, crash analytics doesn't work or something like that, it's definitely not even in the alpha stage. And I'm glad that KMM is past that. But what we need to eliminate right now to get to beta and to finally get to stable is eliminate what the hells during the development phase. And to do that, we will need to work on new garbage collector. We need to simplify Gradle build setup process because right now it's pretty complicated. We need to stabilize IDE because uh, it's nothing major, but it's dev by thousand cuts. And that's what team is focused right on. All right. So I, I, have, a, I have a question here that um... I think goes goes deep to to a lot of our hearts, and that is whether there will still be a Kotlin Conf twenty twenty one. Um, and I can I can only quote Hadi's uh, Twitter on this. Uh, he he replied to this question quite recently, and he said, um, "Kotlin Conf will return, but we do not know yet when that will happen." So, I, all I can say is, uh, "Stay tuned." I guess. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, 2022, but probably it can. Who knows? <laughs> who knows? Yes, who knows? Who knows? Ho hopefully, 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 2022. I'm gonna, but, yeah. I'm gonna throw another question to Nastya. Um, mm -hmm. Are we planning any improvements mm -hmm. for uh, providing better Kotlin native debugging, like an Android Studio plugin or an Xcode plugin or something like this, when it comes to debugging iOS? Uh, well, we already had some improvements on that matter. We have Android Studio plugin that supports debugging on iOS. And folks from Kotlin native team uh, did a good job recently. And we have a lot of debugging improvements on backend sites. As for plugin for Xcode, uh, it's really hard to make a plugin for Xcode. Well, because you know Xcode, we have folks from TouchLab who dare to do that, but we are not even trying to go to that task. And we'll probably have some new exciting updates on that matter, but I can't say anything right now. So you just have to follow our social networks and wait. 
So if people want to learn more about that plugin that already exists for Android Studio, what is is there a key phrase they can look up maybe or a link we have for them? It's KMM plugin for Android Studio and on our KMM portal we have a link to that plugin and uh, instructions about installation and how to work with that. Wonderful. So make sure to check that out as well. There is a question about coroutines, but coroutines for Android developers, I'm probably what you can comment on this. And it's a very general question, like what's the future of coroutines applied for Android development? We are in the middle of a long way to completely replace Rickstore. Right. So some time ago we announced that we mm -hmm. you know officially recommend using coroutines on Android if you're writing apps in Kotlin. It's it's a great way to deal with um, you know writing asynchronous code of which you need a lot on Android. Um, that said, I guess part of my answer is similar to what I said about live data. Like we, we will not tell you, you know, you have to remove RX Java from your, from your apps if if you have a lot of it in your code if it's working for you, you don't have to migrate. And you know there are both uh, community libraries or even in the coroutines library there are adapters for from for converting between different types of libraries and streams and so on. Uh, it's similar with some of our Jetpack APIs where we uh, provide you a version of the API that works for Java users. So uh, we give you listenable futures or RX Java adapters. And for Kotlin we give you um, a suspend or flow version of that API. And I suppose it's going to continue for some time at least. Um, of course, uh, we think coroutines are the solution, and we're going to try to always support that in our APIs. Um, but like I said, you can always um, use something else if, if that works for you. And a somewhat related question. Uh, probably you can just give some uh, links or hints where to go when folks need samples or examples using DSL flow coroutines for Android in Kotlin 1.5 and Firestore. Sorry, samples for what? Uh, just general samples for DSL flow coroutines for specifically mm -hmm. for Android. Okay. Uh, okay, so we do have a few code labs that are specifically about coroutines, um, and uh, one of them is for beginners, one of them is a more advanced sample. Uh, so if anyone wants to learn coroutines, I, I do recommend you check them out. Um, so if you um, if you just go on developer.android.com slash Kotlin, uh, you will find different sections for, for beginners, for advanced topics, and a section called um, additional resources. And you can find a ton of link material in, in there. Yeah, and um, on the Kotlin website, we also have a step-by-step -step coroutines guide, which which is not related to Android, but it's pretty general and starts with the very basics and goes through all the concepts right to the to the advanced ones. Yeah, so, and yeah, uh, study it as well. Yeah, there were many questions about education and learning. Uh, yeah, just can mention that re uh, recently the team revamped kind of the recommendation page how to start learn Kotlin, so you can check it and pick up your case, and then you find more useful links uh, from there. So it uh, it works well for. Uh, I think at our side it covers uh, the general concepts, uh, the language uh, explanations, as well as for us. Uh, if you want to use Android, you go to Android side. If you want to specifically Spring, we have some tutorials, but in general, you go to Spring side and then find all the docs there. And the same for Kato. Kato has its separate site, so you can go there and learn learn how to use Kato there. Kind of obvious, obvious stuff <laughs> to be mentioned, <laughs> but still useful. Speaking of, so from the perspective of an uh, of an Android developer, um, are there any features that are that are upcoming or that are also in this release that that Android developers should specifically pay attention to because uh, you feel that maybe it would help them structure their apps better or, or just be more productive in general? Is this a question for me or someone from the uh, I mean, I'll, I'll be happy to throw it to the open room, but Wojtek, if you want to take it, absolutely. No, I mean, we're always looking at what, um, I mean, we use 
most of the features of Kotlin, right? We always look at maybe which ones are especially great for Android devs. Like uh, I mentioned, coroutines fit perfectly with the whole asynchronous um, calls thing that we need to use on Android because we can't, you know, block the main thread and so on. And if if anything else like this comes up, we always try to try to uh, supply the community with more tutorials and more articles teaching about this. But in general, it's like take what you can from Kotlin and use it. If it works um, in, in general, then there's no reason why not use it on Android. All right, fair enough. Uh, there is um, the question, uh, Slava, you have a lot on the plate of Kotlin native team. So it's like we have that you really have a lot to do. However, our community wants you to do even more and asks whether you have uh, whether you are thinking about support interoperability with Rust. No, and that's the answer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, the answer was also my question. Like, you have a lot on your plate. <laughs> I mean, Kotlin and Rust are completely different languages, and uh, I'm not sure that this is even possible uh, in any mean meaningful way uh, beyond uh, the plain C interoperability, which is, I believe, already possible with Rust. So, I mean, if you generate some C headers for Rust code and import this to Kotlin native, then you probably would have interoperability with Rust. All right, fair enough. So there's another question in regards to build performance. So we've, we've already heard that, that of course, um, the, the front end is going to be big on this, but uh, Saeed also asks about um, the build system itself. Like, are there any active developments on build and performance improvements when using uh, Gradle with Kotlin DSL, for example? Well, if you're asking about, for example, uh, um, for, for example, uh, some features that Gradle introduced recently, for example, um, uh, Gradle configuration cache. Uh, so yes, we are supporting it in uh, Kotlin Gradle plugin. So you should benefit from it as well. Also, we have some work related to in improving incremental compilation theme in Gradle. So you should see some improvements there as well. OK. But it's the whole, I guess. Then there is a question somewhat related to Gradle. Probably it should go to Roman. So there are actually two questions. Alex first asks, have you ever considered any alternative to Gradle? And then, um, I'm not sure I can read this name correctly, Jogwan probably, then uh, gives some hints. Would JetBrains ever consider building its own build tool for Kotlin so we don't have any dependency on Gradle or Maven? So of course, first of all, we, we the Gradle is the only thing we support. So I m might remind you, we also support Maven builds, and we also support and and we support a common line compiler. We can you know want to install and uh, write uh, builds and whatever. In fact, there are community supported uh, plugins for other build system uh, like for Bazel and Bacchus. First, I know uh, some companies do maintain them. Uh, so, because uh, you know you can do this either through command line or through internal compiler APIs. Uh, so it's just uh, the number of, uh, in fact, it's not widely known, but JetBrains actually has its own build system. Uh, it's called GPS, uh, JetBrains Project Structure. It's 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 funny name, but in fact, it's a build system that's used inside uh, IntelliJ internally. So, and you can actually create a pro project, Kotlin project that does not use uh, n nothing, like no Gradle, no Maven, no Ant. It's just built uh, by IntelliJ IDEA through its GPS, and you can even uh, do CI. Uh, it's not very ergonomic beyond you know the fact that you can do it. It's actually great for small uh, uh, playground tasks. For example, when I create a Scratch project that's, that I need to quickly verify, I don't create a Gradle build. I just create you know pure uh, Intel. Uh, I believe a wizard called it IntelliJ. Just you know create IntelliJ project, and that's it. I don't need a Gradle moment. So in in a sense, we already support all of that, uh, and. Uh, you know, the future is open, whatever. Um, if there is a new great build tool on the market, I'm sure Kotlin will support it too. Either if it becomes hugely popular, we will support it. If it's maybe not that huge, I'm sure the interested community will write uh, support in this uh, great build system. 
And I would also add that uh, in multi-platform, uh, we also, well, somehow want to make sure that multi-platform could be supported on other build system, not only in Gradle. And we are working like right now on the design, how to do that. All right. Yeah, but because oh, yeah. it's important, <laughs> we, I think, can say, so it's not about moving from gradually. Yeah. Lots of options and uh, many are available. Yep. Another bit more generic question. Hey, <laughs> that's actually a nice, nice joke. Um, why can the result type uh, still not be used as a return type? And why isn't there a more general either type in Kotlin? It can be used as a result. Of that, that's big. That's a great <laughs> 1.5 feature that you neglected to mention in your overview of 1.5 features. <laughs> well, I guess that one's on us. So uh, yeah, there you go. It can be used as a return type. That's honestly my favorite type of uh, of question or my favorite type of answer is you can do that. It's already it's already there, yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, talking about us, uh, uh, okay. And the question to Seva, I think uh, I would. Uh, so this this specific question from uh, Reese Hub. Some functionalities of Flow are still experimental. When will this be fixed? Future updates. But I would award it more generally in terms of, like we know there are some parts of experimental uh, functionality in Flow and in channels and coroutines. What are general attitude towards stabilizing it? Probably you can all, you already can share the plans when you are going to stabilize well, some stuff. Some not as much for us. Sure. The general answer is it depends, obviously. So for some API, we are just unsure whether it's useful at all, or whether it's um, <clears throat> um, not error prone. Let's say let's say that. And it depends on your feedback. So if you find something which is a, an experimental for a long time and you don't see any plans to promote it to stable, just ping us, let's say on GitHub or on Slack, and share, share your general feedback, general experience, and so on. Regarding other features, we know that they're useful. And we know that we want to stabilize them. For example, flow and some parts of flow like flat maps and so on, and we just don't have enough time to cover all of the libraries at the same time. So it will be the next big thing after coroutine testing. So yeah, actually we are waiting for feedback. So if you want something to become stable sooner, just share it with us. All right. There is a question to Seb. Any Can plans? We at least to provide documentation for publishing our libs to NPM? Uh, yeah, great question. So um, generally, currently, uh, publishing libraries to, to NPM is not our direct focus. That's a bit postponed. There is, however, an NPM publish plugin, which is being currently maintained by the community. And we're in uh, in contact with the authors of that. So I would suggest checking that out. It's, it's a Gradle plugin that you can add, which has a bunch of configuration options. And as far as I know, it also already works with the uh, IR compiler. So yeah, um, give that a shot. Um, it also comes with a bunch of docs around it. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I think we are very close uh, to having used all our time, probably. I don't know, a uh, couple last questions. And um, uh, and uh, we are going to uh, closing uh, this uh, live Q&A session. Again, uh, before we close, I want to repeat that uh, all the unanswered questions, or at least all the meaningful <laughs> unanswered questions, we are going to uh, publish with uh, the answers on AMA on Reddit on 27, 28 of May, you can come there, probably you can find your own questions or you can re-ask it, no problem. You can uh, publish again your question if you haven't got uh, an answer. So uh, please uh, be tuned, uh, please follow our Twitter and the announcement so that you can join 
this AMA question uh, session and check uh, the answers. We did it, I think, for last release event. It was really useful in terms of gathering this information again, answering your questions also kind of in written form. So it's like, <laughs> it's there, it's fixed. Yep. So I, I have an I have a question that's that's maybe interesting enough to spark a discussion. Uh, do you ever plan to treat null as a, a false boolean, or in general have have falsiness or truthiness? What could be broken because of this? No discussion here. No, never. Oh, I mean, we, 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 we another... won't be any discussion on this topic whatsoever <laughs> until I die. Okay. There we go. There you have it. Uh, <laughs> that is a great answer. There's no ambiguity. That's 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 wonderful. Um, yeah, I think uh, that's about all that we have time for today. Uh, unless there's anything, Sveta, you still have anything in your pipeline. No, I just read in comments. Someone commented on Nasta's dog. I missed it. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, our audience is very attentive. <laughs> all right. I got to watch that one in the replay. Um, all right, cool. Then, yeah, of course, there have been a, a bunch of questions that, that went an, unanswered. Mm -hmm. I mean, before this event, uh, yeah, we, we got... in more than more than 500 questions submitted to us and of course you all were, were very active um during this q a mm -hmm. session which uh yeah we appreciate it a lot uh because it really means we we can we can tell that uh that you folks are involved and interested uh which is really nice but yeah i, yeah. I think with it this, will be hard to ask to pick up the winners for t-shirts <laughs> oh that will definitely be a hard task yeah we'll do our best <laughs> all right well then, first of all, let me uh, say goodbye to uh, all of our again Q and A contestants. Uh, maybe and we can big thank you for joining us today, for answering all uh, questions from our audience. Really, thank yeah. you very much for joining us. So all right. I think, yeah, we can say bye to folks. <laughs> all right. Take care. Everyone. Thank you very much for a great. Thank you. Bye. Great show. Bye. Almost. There we go. Oh, Almost. No. There we go. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> yep. It's always a hard task to remove people from the stream, <laughs> you know, I, as I it's no... a hard task to add people to the stream. <laughs> I have no doubt about it. What? Well, yeah. So, do we have any more closing information? I think we've told folks already um, that we will be in AMA? touch with Reddit. Yeah, AMA, Reddit, T shirts. Uh, ah, yeah, yeah, I know, no, there's, uh, there's about this, but subscribe, su but, but. <laughs> remember to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell. There you go. I it did wasn't it me, you. it wasn't me. Yes, thank exactly. you. Too. Don't worry. I, I got you. I have no problem shilling out <laughs> for you. another couple subscribers. Speaking of, you know, now that we're already selling out, make sure to follow Sveta on Twitter and follow me on Twitter. We have our handles right there, uh, right next to our names. Um, I'm still a bit behind her, so make sure you follow me before you follow her. Uh, I'm trying to catch up. She doesn't write often to Twitter. She also follows yes. nobody, which is like the ultimate flex. No, I, I follow Kotlin. I think at, oh. at one point we, we tweeted uh, that Kotlin reached, uh, what was it, uh, 100? Uh, 100,000? Subscribers, yeah. and at that moment it was uh, minus one, so we needed to find. Oh, so you were the one hundred thousand. No, no, no. it was uh, pro probably a couple. Was like, oh yeah, we need to urgently find someone to subscribe to Cottage. Th that's how things work. Yep. But yeah, <laughs> so if no, you want to stay, yeah, if you want to stay up to date with official information, you can of course find that on kotlinlang.org on youtubecom Kotlin, uh, where you are Love. currently. Uh, and on twitter.com slash Kotlin as well. And anywhere else you can find Kotlin information. I mean, you know. thank you a lot for joining. Thank you a lot for surviving this event. Please share your feedback with us uh, in terms of how helpful it is, uh, whether you like this format, uh, whether I answered your questions, and so forth. So, big thank you. Yep. Yeah. And we look forward to uh, seeing you mm -hmm. at the next event with hopefully more Kotlin goodies um, and answering even more of your questions. And it will be even before the next release.
I know that. <laughs> yeah. But stay tuned. <laughs> All right. Stay tuned. And yeah, have a wonderful whatever evening, morning, whatever yes. time it is. And take care. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.